Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 6, which possibly proves Bullrichell's intelligence. On the afternoon of that same Christmas day, 1823, a man had walked for rather a long time in the most deserted part of the boulevard de l'Hospital in Paris. This man had the air of a person who was seeking lodgings, and he seemed to halt, by preference at the most modest houses on that dilapidated border of the Faubourg saint Marceau. We shall see further on that this man had, in fact, hired a chamber in that isolated quarter. This man, in his attire, as in all his person, realized the type of what may be called the well-bred mendicant. Extreme wretchedness combined with extreme cleanliness. This is a very rare mixture which inspires intelligent hearts with that double respect which one feels for the man who is very poor, and for the man who is very worthy. He wore a very old and very well-brushed round hat, a coarse coat, worn perfectly threadbare of an ochre yellow, a color that was not in the least eccentric at that epoch, a large waistcoat with pockets of a venerable cut, black breeches, worn gray at the knee, stockings of black worsted, and thick shoes with copper buckles. He would have been pronounced a preceptor in some good family, Returned from the emigration, he would have been taken for more than sixty years of age from his perfectly white hair, his wrinkled brow, his livid lips, and his countenance, where everything breathed depression and weariness of life. Judging from his firm tread, from the singular vigor which stamped all his movements, he would have hardly been thought fifty. The wrinkles on his brow were well placed, and would have disposed in his favor anyone who observed him attentively. His lip contracted with a strange fold, which seemed severe and which was humble. There was, in the depth of his glance, an indescribable melancholy serenity. In his left hand, he carried a little bundle tied up in a handkerchief. In his right, he leaned on a sort of cudgel cut from some hedge. This stick had been carefully trimmed and had an air that was not too threatening. The most had been made of its knots, and it had received a coral-like head, made from red wax. It was a cudgel, and it seemed to be a cane. There were but few passers-by on that boulevard, particularly in the winter. The man seemed to avoid them rather than to seek them, but this without any affection. At that epoch, King Louis XVIII went nearly every day to choisy le roy It was one of his favorite excursions. Towards two o'clock, almost invariably, the royal carriage and cavalcade was seen to pass at full speed along the Boulevard de la Hapelol. This served in lieu of a watch or clock to the poor women of the quarter who said, It is two o'clock. There he is returning to the Tuileries. And some rushed forward, and the others drew up in line. For a passing king always creates a tumult. Besides, the appearance and disappearance of Louis XVIII produced a certain effect in the streets of Paris. It was rapid but majestic. This impotent king had a taste for a fast gallop, 
As he was not able to walk, he wished to run. That cripple would gladly have made himself drawn by the lightning. He passed, pacific and severe in the midst of naked swords. His massive couch, all covered with gilding with great branches of lilies painted on the panels, thundered noisily along. There was hardly time to cast a glance upon it. In the rear angle on the right, there was visible on tufted cushions of white satin a large, firm, and ruddy face. A brow freshly powdered, a Lerzel Royale. A proud, hard, crafty eye. The smile of an educated man. Two great epaulets with bullion fringe floating over a bourgeois coat. The Golden Fleece. The Cross of St. Louis. The Cross of the Legion of Honor. The Silver Plaque of the Saint Esprit a huge belly, and a wide blue ribbon. It was the king. Outside of Paris, he held his hat decked with white ostrich plumes on his knees and wrapped in high English gaiters. When he re-entered the city, he put on his hat and saluted rarely. He stared coldly at the people, and they returned it in kind. When he appeared for the first time in the St. Marceau Quarter... The whole success which he produced is contained in this remark of an inhabitant of the Faubourg of his comrade. That big fellow yonder is the government. This infallible passage of the king at the same hour was, therefore, the daily event of the Boulevard de la Hapidel. The promenader in the yellow coat evidently did not belong in the quarter, and probably did not belong in Paris, for he was ignorant as to this detail. When at two o'clock, the royal carriage surrounded by a squadron of the bodyguard, all covered with silver lace, debauched on the boulevard, after having made the turn of the Salopetiere. He appeared surprised and almost alarmed. There was no one but himself in this cross lane. He drew up hastily behind the corner of the wall of an enclosure, though this did not prevent Monsieur de Luc Havre from spying him out. Monsieur le Duc de Havre, as captain of the guard on duty that day, was seated in the carriage opposite the king, he said to his majesty, Yonder is an evil-looking man. Members of the police, who were clearing the king's route, took equal note of him. One of them received an order to follow him. But the man plunged into the deserted little streets of the Faubourg. And as twilight was beginning to fall, the agent lost trace of him, as is stated in a report addressed the same evening to Monsieur le Count d'Anglas, Minister of State, Prefect of Police, when the man in the yellow coat had thrown the agent off his track, he redoubled his pace, not without turning round many a time to assure himself that he was not being followed. At a quarter past four, that is to say, when night was fully come, he passed in front of the theater of the Port St. Martin, where the two convicts was being played that day. This poster, illuminated by the theater lantern, struck him. For although he was walking rapidly... He halted to read it. An instant later, he was in the blind alley of the La Planchette, and he entered the Plate d'Athene, the pewter platter, where the office of the coach for Langney was then situated. This coach set out at half past four. The horses were harnessed, and the travelers summoned by the coachman were hastily climbing the lofty iron ladder of the vehicle. The man inquired, Have you a place? Only one beside me on the box, said the coachman. I will take it. Climb up. Nevertheless, before setting out, the coachman cast a glance at the traveler's shabby dress, at the diminutive size of his bundle, and made him pay his fare. Are you going as far as Langney? demanded the coachman. Yes, said the man. The traveler paid to Langney. They started. When they had passed the barrier, the coachman tried to enter into conversation, but the traveler only replied in monosyllables. The coachman took to whistling and swearing at his horses. The coachman wrapped himself up in his cloak. It was cold. The man did not appear to be thinking of that. Thus, they passed Gournay and nearly Sir Marne. Towards six o'clock in the evening, they reached Chelles. The coachman drew up in front of the Carter's Inn and stalled in the ancient buildings of the Royal Abbey to give his horses a breathing spell. I get down here, said the man. He took his bundle and his cudgel and jumped down from the vehicle. An instant later, he had disappeared. He did not enter the inn. 
When the coach set out for Langney a few minutes later, it did not encounter him in the principal street of Chell's. The coachman turned to the inside travelers. There, said he, is a man who does not belong here, for I do not know him. He had not the air of owning a sou, but he does not consider money. He pays to Langney, and he goes only as far as Chell's. It is night. All the houses are shut. He does not enter the inn, and he is not to be found. So he has dived through the earth. The man had not plunged into the earth, but he had gone with great strides through the dark, down the principal street of Chell's. Then he had turned to the right before reaching the church, into the crossroad leading to Montfermier, like a person who was acquainted with the country and had been there before. He followed this road rapidly. At the spot where it intersected by the ancient tree-bordered road, which runs from Gangney to Langney, he heard people coming. He concealed himself precipitately in a ditch, and there waited until the passers-by were at a distance. The precaution was nearly superfluous, however, for as we've already said, it was a very dark December night. No more than two or three stars were visible in the sky. It is at this point that the ascent of the hill begins. The man did not return to the road to Montfermier. He struck across the fields to the right and entered the forest with long strides. Once in the forest, he slackened his pace and began a careful examination of all the trees, advancing step by step, as though seeking and following a mysterious road known to himself alone. There came a moment when he appeared to lose himself, and he paused in indecision, at last, he arrived, by dint of feeling his way inch by inch, at a clearing where there was a great heap of whitish stones. He stepped up briskly to these stones and examined them attentively through the mist of the night, as though he were passing them in review. A large tree, covered with those excrescences which are the warts of vegetation, stood a few paces distant from the pile of stones. He went up to this tree and passed his hand over the bark of the trunk, as though seeking to recognize and count all the warts. Opposite this tree, which was an ash, there was a chestnut tree, suffering from a peeling of the bark to which a band of zinc had been nailed by way of dressing. He raised himself on tiptoe and touched this band of zinc. And then he trod about for a while on the ground comprised in the space between the tree and the heap of stones, like a person who's trying to assure himself that the soil has not recently been disturbed, that done, he took his bearings and resumed his march through the forest. It was the man who had just met Cosette. As he walked through the thicket in the direction of Montfermier, he had espied that tiny shadow moving with a groan, depositing a burden on the ground, then taking it up and setting out again. He drew near and perceived that it was a very young child laden with an enormous bucket of water. Then he approached the child and silently grasped the handle of the bucket. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.